Hi everyone, it's Jerry. This is round eight from the 2014 Sinkfield Cup between Fabiano Caruana playing as white and Magnus Carlsen. Going into this round, Caruana remains perfect with seven out of seven, and Carlsen has four out of seven. So let's see what took shape in this one, and let's see if someone can finally put an end to this perfect streak. So Caruana opening with e4 in this one, Carlsen replying with the Sicilian. Knight f3, knight c6. We have an open Sicilian with the d4. And now g6 enters a dragon structure. c4. Roxy bind. Having now a grip over both d5 and b5, the two pawn breaks for black. So knight f6, knight c3. To defend e4. Keep in mind that there's no worry on the black side of white taking on c6 and pushing the knight around. Queen a5 would win the pawn. So it's knight c3, d6. And now f3. This bishop wants to play to e3, but playing there immediately would allow knight g4 to kick the bishop. So f3 secures the bishop's position. And, well, b4 the bishop can be in a position to defend the knight on d4. Black captures... And now it's the queen who gets to recapture, or who is forced to recapture. And she seems very well placed, but this is only short-lived. Since after bishop, g7, bishop e3, and castles, now there's the threat of knight g4, throwing a punch at both queen and bishop. So she needs to find a new home. Queen d2 is best. Playing somewhere else, such as d3, runs into these types of tempo gaining moves. So it's queen d2 and now a5. This looks to uh, eventually induce some queenside weaknesses in the white camp and in this game it turns out to be the c4 square. Some drawbacks related to the a5 advance are that both b6 and b5 are weakened and well, with b5 weakened, we can be sure that this idea of a b5 pawn break is ruled out. So that's one of the downsides with this advance. So moving forward, it's b3, a4, and now b4. Keep in mind, knight takes a4 is shot down. Knight takes e4, and there goes your rook. So you can't do this. Move b4 was played. If you're doing something other than b4 here, such as rook b1, well, you're making life too easy for the black rook. He has exactly what he would want, a completely open file. So white's going to make that more difficult. b4, this file now remains closed. He's going to have to work a little harder to get active. And with b4, we have now the c4 square that's a bit soft. And at the same time, c5 is also being controlled. And so there can maybe at some point be a new possibility on the white side, namely a c5 pawn break. Okay, so bishop e6. Uh, quite logical to put pressure on the weakest point in the white camp. This is a common reorganization of pieces, by the way. Or I should state it as we will often see the bishop play to e6 when we have this uh, kingside fianchetto, this out of this dragon uh, structure, we'll see the bishop often play to e6 to not only watch over a knight hopping into d5, but in this case, of course, to put pressure on c4, and to now allow the knight to uh, drop back to d7. You'll notice there could be some instances where as soon as, I'm not saying in this exact position, but if this bishop is not first placed on e6 and this knight tries to go for some maneuver with d7 or b6 or somewhere else, you'll notice that the d5 square would not be guarded. But by playing your bishop to e6 first, it's a little role reversal. The bishop is there to watch over d5, strike at c4. Now I could a bit more uh, freely play this knight d7 move without any concern of knight to d5. Again, I'm not referencing it in this exact position, but just the idea. There is, of course, this uh, tactic that would be available if white is playing knight to d5 right away. Okay, well, 
In reply to bishop e6, it was rook c1, quite good, getting it uh, in a spot out of the line of fire for one, and there to watch over c4. In comes knight d7, bishop e2, knight b6. Consistent, putting more pressure on c4, and even more pressure is right around the corner with rook c8. White's there to defend, knight b5 is one of one way you can defend c4. The one that may even be more natural looking is to centralize the knight to uh, allow both pieces to uh, defend, to allow the rook to defend, and just block any pressure by the bishop. But notice one of the differences, or maybe the main difference between both of these squares. Knight b5 is not so welcome to peace exchanges, whereas knight d5 maybe is. You can have these knights come off at any moment. White, keep in mind, has that space advantage. Maybe wants to keep three pairs of minor pieces on the board. Knight b5 comes with an additional idea. In the game, we had Carlson playing a3, and one of the main ideas behind this is to stop white from playing knight to a3. You'll notice if black in this position played rook c8, white can play knight a3. It seems quite odd to retreat the knight like this and throw him on the edge of the board, but he's serving a very good role that of watching over c4, and with this point secure, where exactly is black's active plan? Will it be b5? Don't see that happening. d5? Nope. f5? That's probably it. If I'm to take this just a little bit further, suppose knight d7 and castles, let's say f5 is in. In many of these videos, I'll often talk about Upon majorities, especially the ones in the center, the current situation, black has a 2-0 to zero advantage, but it's hard to really see these pawns as being an advantage for black. It's not as if they are further advanced on the fifth rank. They're re they really are not posing any threat to the white side in such a position. Okay, well, after knight to b5, this knight was never even given an option to drop into a3 to defend c4 because black plays a3. Ruling this out and also with an idea of playing knight a4 to drop into b2 or maybe even c3. Bishop and knight are well coordinated. Knight on a4 and that bishop over here on g7 eye up these b2 and c3 squares. So okay knight d4 hits the bishop, he drops back, and now h4. And with this 17th move, we're quickly reminded as a viewer of this game that uh, play doesn't necessarily have to take place on the queen side alone. We, that's where we had a lot of the action up until this point, but with h4, this is something we would see out of the Sicilian Dragon Yugoslav attack, where the king is residing over here on the queen side, He's still in the center, but maybe this is a quite okay home. Maybe he could simply step up to f2, and before you know it, this other rook can be getting over to the h-file if it is to open up. So, very aggressive intentions with this h4 move, looking for h5 and to peel open the h-file. These other ideas spring to mind of removing the dark square bishop and uh, going right for that black king's throat. So, black of course sees this idea, playing h5, white will have to work harder to get some break in, and white does so. g4, looks to open up the g file and or h file, black has to do something about that, capturing on g4, f takes g, both sides of the board are being made use of. We saw a lot of action early on on the queen side with these pawn advances b4, some pressure on the c4 point, but now the attention, well, we have to pay a little bit more attention, of course, or maybe our primary focus needs to be over here on the king's side. One wrong slip, and that could be it. Primar primarily for black, I believe they're the side who has to be much more cautious with this uh, rook ready to become active on the h-file after an h5 break. So black needs to strike, do something 
active here, be direct with play. e5 is the move. Not one that you really want to make, not a move you want to make, because, well, you can forget about this bishop looking at any of these queenside squares. He decreases in his activity, but I think it's very important to dislodge this knight from the d4 square, the ideal post for a knight. And one, this knight right here, is one who can simply drop a hammer on the position if given the opportunity. If this knight is not kicked from his strong post, he can very well play into a square you didn't think possible, such as f5. This is a common peace sacrifice you need to be aware of on the black side. Dropping the knight into f5 in a, in a timely manner, for example... Let's say the knight is not dislodged from his strong pose. Suppose something is natural looking as rook to c8, half open file. Okay, well, we can play as bl as white, bishop to h6, looking to remove the main defender of this king. And if you're trying to now kick the knight one move later with e5, I am in no way saying this is best, but you can sh give strong consideration to this knight to f5 move. This, if uh, you can't see it in the video, but the evaluation is somewhere around a half pawn advantage for white. And that's being down in this position a minor piece and only having a pawn to show for it. My main point here is just to recognize that this is a potentially deadly uh, move in the game. So he needs to be dealt with immediately. He needs to be kicked from d4 immediately. e5 is it. Knight, knight to f5 in this position, it's not, not nearly as effective as it would be one move later with the bishop being on the h6 square already. So we don't have that. It's not knight f5, instead knight b3. This knight has taken quite the journey if you're keeping track. He deployed to c3, b5, d4, b3, and eventually he gets to that a5 square. Okay, so the follow-up is bishop c6, pointing at the weak point e4, and now bishop f3, simply there to defend. And one interesting note that Caruana uh, pointed out after the game, he was asked, did he consider bishop d3? And uh, he wanted to play to f3 to have the idea of later playing bishop to g4. He was at this point anticipating f5, the move that was played in the game. And we can a bit more clearly see this idea, because after g takes f, g takes f, as soon as this pawn captures or moves forward, sure enough, this bishop will be on a fast track to get to g4 and maybe a later e6 with check, or even this uh, f5 square. So that's uh, just an interesting point that I uh, came across, or when he was being interviewed after the game, d3 would not have that g4 square available, of course. So, in reply to that pressure, it was bishop f3, f5, takes, takes, and now knight a5, looking to scoop up that bishop. Now f4, shutting down the position a bit, trying to keep it a bit closed for this king to be safe. Bishop drops back. Knight a4, looking at these, uh, this square right here, b2. And as the follow-up, knight takes bishop. There is a, another option black had in this position instead of f4. And that was to meet knight to a5 with taking the knight, something that I don't like. Uh, I don't know that you could really justify this type of exchange sacrifice. These These pieces here are all going to be working very soon. The ones who are not working really well in this position are the knight on a4 and the rook on c1. There are open files in the position, and I believe both rooks will uh, be quick to make use of those open files. As a follow-up in this position, if we did have this idea by black to take the knight and then drop the knight into a4, we could have bishop g5. If black is reacting, we could now have rook g1. And then looking to get this bishop involved with bishop to h5. And again, these four pieces are all contributing 
This is the only rook not doing a great deal. Neither is this knight, however. I, b I believe white is the preferred side. Again, I'm not really seeing the uh, benefit for going in, uh, in for that exchange sacrifice. So uh, Carlson didn't go down that road. It was not rook takes knight, but rather knight a4. I'm sorry, f4 first, bishop f2, and now knight a4. Knight takes bishop, pawn takes knight, white has the bishop pair. Welcome to, of course, the position opening up. And now white castles. The move, this move here struck me as a bit odd. I was thinking about king to e2 in this position. The computer cries out for, uh, well, I don't know, cries out, but one, one of the moves that it's considering is h5. I was thinking more along the lines of king to e2 as being a perfectly good home for the king. Well, maybe that's a stretch to see, say perfectly good, but I didn't really see a way that this knight can cause the king any problems, and I didn't see a way, or at least I'm not seeing a way, that another black piece can get involved to try to dislodge the king's position on e2. I think that this is a pretty safe home, and it allows for the other rook to get involved over here on the g1 square. We didn't have that. Instead, white castled. Staying far away from the knight, he's certainly not going to bother the white king. And now we have b5, which is a bit of a curious move to see, because at first glance, you're of course giving up this d5 square, and that would come with check. Um, the give and take with this move is, well, you give up d5 for maybe a timely check, but at the same time, you're allowing this knight to eventually make use of b6, where he can put pressure on c4. Black needs to get this knight working. He's a dead piece over here on the edge. And uh, the action is still related to uh, the king's side of the board, attacking one another's king. So after c5, it was b5. White has this connected pass pawn, something that would increase in value as the as we approach an endgame, especially if it turns into a, a king and pawn endgame. So bishop f6 is a follow-up, king h1. With king h1, this pawn on h4 is indirectly defended. In the game, we had knight b6. If this pawn is taken, there would follow rook g1, and now rook g2 with the main idea to place this rook on h2 and get this inactive rook finally contributing over here on g1. What's maybe best on the black side is to play rook f7, but what follows is bishop takes bishop, rook h7, Rook h2, and after rook takes h4, there is now queen f2. And this is a disaster for black. If rook takes rook, queen takes, and we're going to be having mate very soon. Okay, well, we didn't have that. After king to h1, it was not bishop takes pawn. Again, he is indirectly defended. This pawn, you might also view it as a good defender for the black king. He at least will find shelter over here on the h-file for as long as he's around. Okay, in the game it was knight b6. Rook on c to d1. A better play would have been to play the rook on f to d1. By playing the rook on c to d1, this, this point here is a bit soft. Something that cannot be taken right away because of queen d5 and the knight would be won. But at a later stage in the game one that's not long off from now, that c-pawn drops. This would have been a better move, rook on f to d1. And how do you meet the threat against d6? And could you at this point get away with taking on h4? No, you cannot, because of these similar ideas with rook g1 and a rook lift to follow, with both rooks getting involved against an attack against the king. So after rook f to d1, this pawn would still be immune from being captured. Apparent best is bishop e7, but this allows bishop takes c5. Cute little tactic. If pawn takes bishop, we're not going to take the queen. We're going to come over here to g2, throw a check, and then there goes the queen. It's a slick little move right there. Neat little tactic. Bishop takes c5. Queen scoots over, and there goes your queen. So 
It was not rook f to d1. Instead, rook c to d1. And now king h8, queen takes d6. Queen takes queen, rook takes queen, knight takes c4. And now rook to d5. What we're going to enter right now is an opposite color bishop ending after knight e3. That lands a fork. He needs to be taken out. So it was bishop takes knight, pawn takes, and now bishop to e2. Eventually what happens is that this position simplifies quite a bit. Both rooks end up getting exchanged, and with just the bishops on board, there's not much fight left in the game. A better play for this rook at this point right here, after the knight takes on c4, would be to play to the 7th with the idea if the knight drops into e3 you can take him out and now this b pawn is very threatening ready to play the b7 with tempo just a single square away from queening and black will find it much more difficult to defend this position as an example if rook b8 there is b7 and if rook g8 you have to try to get rid of this rook somehow. Rook g8 looks to do just that, getting him off of the seventh rank. There could be rook b1, bishop takes h4, rook c7. This is as far as I want to take it. I just want to highlight how dangerous this pawn could be being a single square away coupled with a rook on the seventh is very, very effective. You're not just restricting, by having this pawn on b7, you're not just restricting to the rook on b8 to being very passive, but also the rook over here on g8, both rooks, and one might even reason the king, are all very passive, being cut off. If this rook is to go elsewhere, off of the 8th rank, there's always these ideas of rook to c8, that type of tactic. So, having this right here, these two pawns, or I'm sorry, the pawn and the rook on the seventh rank, you really restrict both rooks and king. It's a very strong position for white. We didn't have that. In this position, after knight takes c4, it was not rook d7, not placing the rook on the seventh, but rather rook d5. And now knight e3, bishop takes, knight pawn takes. Opposite color bishops. Material is not necessarily as important in these types of endings. Bishop e2, bishop takes h4, rook f5. If this rook is going to be taken, white will have another pass pawn. Black sees that as being quite all right. Rook takes, pawn takes. Both sides have passed pawns. These guys over here on the a-file offset. Rook d8, and now the rooks are exchanged. And this one will quickly dwindle down to a drawn position. If something other than exchanging this last, uh, these last rooks here, if rook e5, well, this rook is now very active. Rook d2 can happen. And if white isn't careful, white can drop the a2 pawn, and maybe this pawn becomes very scary, being just two squares away from queening. And keep in mind, Either side queening here would be coming at this stage right here with check. If something such as bishop to c4, there can fall a rook d4. If bishop b3, if bishop b3, there could be c4. White has to be very careful in this position if he is, in other words, to avoid the rook exchange. Rook takes pawn. Again, he gets very active. So white apparently saw it best. To exchange rooks. Kings need to get involved. And again, material isn't going to be so necessary right here. That pawn push giving him up just so the bishop can now play to b6. This pawn is now defended. Equal material after bishop to d3 is at this point that the players agreed to a draw. So a very good fight. This, la this final position right here uh, if we look at the pawns, they offset one another. There's not much progress to be made. The bishop on d3, he's watching over this pawn from advancing, so he's restricted. 
if we look at the dark square bishop, he's performing two functions, A, to stop the pawn from advancing, and B, to watch over the pawn. The white king, he's stopping the black pawn from advancing, he's watching over a pawn. The black king is performing two functions, to defend the pawn and stop the white pawn from advancing. So, every piece in this position is uh, restricted in some way, and it's very difficult to come up with any active plan. The only active plan at this point in the game is for white to try something like king to d5, and then after bishop to d4, king c6, there can follow e4, can't take the pawn because this guy promotes, so bishop e2, king takes f5, again this is just showing you this to highlight one active plan in the position, but this, this too would end as a draw. The bishop ends up getting one, but at the end of it, this king and pawn ending is going to be a draw. You just basically mimic the black king at this point. A1, C1, A2, C2, and if the black king does, or if the black side does something else like A2, well, that's stalemate. But as it was in this game, after this a very interesting struggle, bishop to d3, it's at this point they agreed to a draw. And with that, the uh, streak stops. It had to come to an end at some point, and uh, it was certainly a very good run. And with that, Caruana ends up winning the Sinkfield Cup 2014, still with two rounds to go. Again, I've said it time and time again, it's really, really impressive stuff. Um, two rounds to go. I already clinched it, and with that, the $100,000 top prize. So um, that's all for this video. As always, I hope you got something out of it. Take care.